Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub, and I'm old enough so that when I was growing up as a child, I would listen with members of my family, sometimes all alone in my bedroom, to the great radio stars who graced the airways every week, bringing dramas and cowboys and Indians and space cadets and wonderful hours of laughter and music into our homes. There was Sergeant Preston. How many of you remember Sergeant Preston, the Lone Ranger, the Shadow, Mystery Theater, Tallulah Bankhead, Jimmy Durante, Red Skelton, many of whom then moved on to the early days of television in the 1950s, when we would watch on what now seems to be very teeny tiny television screens in black and white, and the pictures would never be stable, and we'd watch anyway, always adjusting the rabbit ears antenna. And there was Molly uh, Goldberg, there was I Remember Mama, Texaco cavalcade of stars with Mr. Television himself, Milton Berle, your show of shows with Sid Caesar and Imogene Coca, and a slew of extraordinarily gifted writers and performers, among them Mel Brooks and Carl Reiner. And there was Steve Allen and Dave Garraway and Howdy Doody and Bob Smith and Ed Sullivan and George Burns and Gracie Allen. And then there was the class act of them all, a man whose self-deprecating humor, his act of being a cheapskate. And anyone who listened to radio or watched television in the 1950s and 60s knew the classic routine when confronted by a mugger who gives you the option, your money or your life, and then there would be this deliciously timed pause. And then when pushed for an answer, the perfectly timed response, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. Any of you who listen to radio or watch television at the time well know that I'm referring to the unique comic genius of a most <clears throat> lovely American comedic icon, Jack Benny. And I am so thrilled to be joined now on this edition of L'Chaim by Jack Benny's daughter, Joan Benny. Joan, thank you so much for joining us. It's my pleasure, Mark. By the way, I was thinking as I was getting ready to meet you, I wonder what it was like for you as a child to have such, again, an iconic figure as Jack Benny as your father, and whether you as a child appreciated who he was the way you now do as an adult looking back. It, it di at very different because living it was one thing. Looking back on it, I feel like I dreamed it. I look back on these magic days, and they were magic. And I think, did I, it was so long ago. Did I dream that? Did I really live that life of being the celebrity's daughter, of going to the radio shows on Sunday? Did you? And being, oh, I went to the radio shows oh. every Sunday and sat in the sponsor's booth and watched the show. Uh, and by the way, quick digression, Sergeant Preston, you forgot, of the Yukon. That's correct, Sergeant <clears throat> Preston of the Yukon. Very, very good. So you listened? <laughs> of course. I listened to all their shows. My favorite, I love The Shadow. The Shadow. Yes, The Shadow knows. Mm. Um, <laughs> no, it was, uh, it was a kind of paradox in a way because I was, on Sundays, I was the celebrity's daughter. Yes. And the rest of the week, I was a schoolgirl. Where were you living? In Beverly Hills, uh -huh. and Beverly Hills was a very pretty community, a certainly uh, up, up scale. We had a lovely home, but it was nothing palatial. It was a very pretty two-story house, and the, one of my favorite memories, which you might enjoy, was this is when I was in grade school. I would come home from school, and on Wednesdays, the writers came to our house to, ah. write, to write the show with my father. And I would go in the library after school with my milk and cookies and sit very quietly in a corner like a little mouse 
and listen to them write the show. It was wonderful. It was there were so many laughs, and yet very very serious. Comedy was very serious, and they would go over it. The writers had already written the show on Monday and Tuesday, and this was the first meeting with my father, where they went over it sentence by sentence, word by word. Literally, is it funnier to say the left foot, or is it funnier to say the left foot? I, it was it was painstaking, uh -huh. and they were they were so wonderful that their sense of comedy, their their sense of timing. But one of my favorite memories is if somebody came up with a punchline that was the right one, because they would throw out lines, and finally one of them would say something which was that was it, and you would see five serious faces going, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> do you remember who these writers were? Oh, do who I ever. They? Milt Josephsberg, John Tackaberry, Sam Perrin, and George Balzer. Those were the four writers. And your father wrote as well? He, yes, he did. But more than that, he was the editor. I think one of my fathers, I mean, if you want to talk about him as being a very talented man in yes. his field, I think one of his major talents was editing. He knew how to edit a show, and again, with, with that right timing, he knew when a routine went too long. If a, and you've seen many comedy shows where you say, end it, you know, yes, it's, yes. You, that's enough. And he knew when it was enough. And he was good at that. Uh huh. Um, I want to almost skip to the end and ask you a question about your father in this regard. The people who I have spoken with who did have contact with him, they describe him in very lovely terms, and he came across lovely on television. There are other performers who are able to do that, and they're not lovely. What was your father like as a person? What you saw was what you got. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the public's perception of him which was that this was really a nice man. Yes. In spite of the humor and the cheap skate and all that, that he was a nice man. He was. He was the nicest man I ever knew, truly. Was he a good father? He was a wonderful father. Now, that wasn't, he wasn't, he was around a lot, and we had a wonderful relationship, particularly uh, when I was a very little girl, and then there were years he was very busy. Again, we were close, but when he went back to playing the violin and started playing in concerts, I was a pianist, so we had all of a sudden this bond of classical music. Did you play together? Yes, we did. Oh, how thrilling we is that? We did. How thrilling. We played Mozart violin sonatas. <laughs> we even played once in public, and by that I mean this was... Oh, can I tell you about, this is crazy, this is a, all of a sudden a memory comes to mind at a party. I think it was at my house. There were about 16 guests, and after dinner, and there'd been a fair amount of drinking, and after dinner it was suggested that everybody had to perform, but they had to perform in something they weren't normally, that they didn't normally do. And having had a few drinks, people were pretty loose, and finally, at the end of the evening, it was, okay, Joni, Jack, come on, do something. Well, I don't do, I mean, I don't know how to perform anything. But I, so my father had his violin, and I said, come on, Daddy, let's do a duet. So he comes with his violin. I sit down at the piano. This is and, impromptu? <clears throat> yes. Wow. I had the music, yes. so I opened the music, and we play very badly <laughs> one of the Mozart a little bit of one of the Mozart sonatas. And the funniest thing about it, I don't know if this will strike you funny, but my p image, my picture of it, Jack Lemon, who, had, who was known as a drinker, and he'd had quite a bit to drink. <clears throat> Excuse me. He's sitting on the sofa, and we play this thing, and I look over, and Jack, his, the tears are really, and he, Jack says, isn't that sweet? <laughs> <laughs> That I will nice never for you. forget that. that. Very nice. I will very never nice. forget that. But what your father was, despite how he played the role, he was a very accomplished violinist, yes? Um, I wouldn't say. I think he was when he was young. I, he studied violin. He played professionally. By that, I mean he played the violin in the Pitt Orchestra in a vaudeville theater. 
But then when he went on the stage in vaudeville, he started out as an act with a piano and a violin. He, he had a partner who played piano, and they played semi-classical music. In vaudeville. Mm -hmm. You understand, that sounds in some way out of place. One doesn't imagine, <clears throat> the way we imagine vaudeville, it's all comedy. Oh, not at all. Com not at all. No, vaudeville was a conglomerate. It was everything. Anybody who could do anything on the stage was in vaudeville. And Whether you juggled or did an acrobatic true. act. That's true. Or, it was all the various vaudeville And how old acts. was your father when he started? He, Roughly. Okay. You want a little biography? I do. A little quick biography. Um, as I said, he played, he learned to play violin. His mother wanted him to be a concert violinist. That wasn't going to happen. Be and let me, what was, his, what was his mother's name? What was his father's name? Emma. <laughs> his, mother name, his mother's name was Emma Sachs, and his father was Meyer Kabelski. Mm -hmm. And he was Benjamin Kabelski. And when he got to high school, he was a terrible student. He, he daydreamed all day. He was supposed to be practicing the violin. He would be looking out at Lake Michigan, dreaming of faraway places. So at the end of his freshman year in high school, he dropped out. He was kicked out, whatever. And he got a job at the local vaudeville theater, I think the Berenson Theater in Waukegan, Illinois, which is where he grew up. And he played in the pit there for a while. At some point, don't know how much, like he was probably 16, 15 or 16, the Marx Brothers came to town and they played the Berenson Theater. I'm not even sure if they were the Marx Brothers at that point, whether they had the Groucho Harpo names. But the mother, Minnie, asked my father if he would go on the road with them. I don't know how they all met or got together, but she wanted him to go on the road. And my father's parents said, no, 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 you're not old enough. You may leave home when you're 18 and not a moment before. So when my father turned 18, he left home with a middle-aged widow lady uh. <laughs> who was going to take good care of him, right. who played piano, Cora Salisbury. And I think they only played little theaters n nearby. I mean, they didn't go to the West Coast or anything far away. But they had a little vaudeville act of the piano violin. And that lasted until the First World War. He then joined the Navy. And he was stationed very close to home at the Great Lakes Naval Training Station. And he played the violin in the orchestra. And Pat O'Brien, do you remember the actor sure. Pat O'Brien? He was there at the same time, and he was putting together a show for the Navy, a kind of naval version of Yip Yip Ya Hank, something of that nature, and asked my father if he would take part in it and play a role as well as playing the violin. So my father did some kind of role, I don't remember what it was, but the audience laughed, he did, and he loved it. <laughs> he got laughs for the very first time in his life. So fade out, war is over, he goes back into vaudeville, no more Cora Salisbury, he has a different partner, and now he starts telling a few jokes in between playing violin. And then he tells a few more jokes, a little less violin, and this goes on for many years. What I didn't realize until, you know, I wrote a book about him, and... Entitled? Sunday Nights at Seven. Sunday Nights at Seven. Which is when his radio show was on in the East Coast. Anyway, I didn't realize until I started researching to do the book that my father was in vaudeville for 20 years. That's a long yes, time to learn your craft. He went into radio in 1932. He'd been in vaudeville for 20 years when he got into radio. At what point, if you know, does the Jack Benny persona begin to develop because your father <clears throat> ultimately really developed a character. Oh, yes. And the character first began on radio and then moved to television. And in some way, even when he was in films, he played the same character. And I want to know if you know, as you describe this development of his, the, you know, the, the arc of his career, whether you know at what point does he become 
the character that everybody now associates with the Jack Benny, the pause, the look, the, you know, the Johnny Carson mimicked when he <laughs> wanted to. Yes. Do you have any idea how that developed? I think, and I, I'm not sure, Mark, but I think that it evolved. I think some of it even started as early as vaudeville. Pardon me. I think if he told a cheap joke, for example, and he was playing Peoria, and the audience laughed, he would keep it in when his next gig was in Chicago. Uh -huh. And and then he would, you know, in vaudeville, vaudeville was great because you could try out material and you weren't doing it in front of millions of people like in television. You had an audience of 50 people, so if, if it bombed, you'd go on to the next city and nobody knew that you had bombed in the city before. You could almost start fresh. So all of these things, the timing, he certainly developed his timing in, yes. in the vaudeville years. When he first went into radio, he didn't have his own show. It was, I think, an, it was a show with an orchestra, and he was almost an MC. I'm not even sure I'm right about that. It's in the book where he wrote about his own life. But it evolved in the early days of radio when he the characters got on the show, like Rochester. Yes. And Rochester, I've been asked this question a lot, and I think it's kind of fun. How did Rochester get onto, you know, my father's show and become the character? My father was going from New York to California in real life. He was moving there. He was going to be doing his shows from Hollywood. And so the writers wrote a show where he was on the train on his way, and they needed, what in, back in those days, they called a red cap, a porter. And they interviewed a lot of people, and they came across Eddie Anderson. That was his real name. Yeah, and who interviewed for the part, and Eddie Anderson got the part. And of course, he was such a huge success. They wanted to keep him on the show, but they said, well, you can't keep going back and forth from Los Angeles to New York. So he evolved into the valet. and. His character became so indelible that even his wife called him Rochester. Nobody ever <laughs> called him Eddie Anderson again. Mm -hmm. Did they have any relationship offset? No. Yes, and that, that you became an illusion for the audience. The audience somehow believed that we were looking into Jack Benny's life. Yes. There was Mary Livingston, his wife. There was Eddie That was Ant true. Right? Yes. There was Rochester... His, by the way, after World War II, there's a famous story about how your father insisted to kind of recreate that character, trying to get as, rid of as many black stereotypes as possible and elevate the character of Rochester so that he almost became sort of a partner, although obviously a junior partner. But in many ways, Rochester was the needle that was always you oh know, yes, keeping your father oh, on the straight always narrow. Always got the better right. of him. Oh. That was the the conceit of the of that character, and then you had the Phil Foster, and uh, is Who that was right? Phil Foster? Was it Phil Foster? Phil Harris. Phil Harris, right? Phil the Harris. orchestra leader, right? Phil Harris, who was always drinking. The, yes, which was partly true in real life. <laughs> right. Yeah, um, but those people not did not necessarily have a relationship with Jack Benny <clears throat> off the set. Well. If you think about, and I don't know you well, Mark, but and I don't know who your coterie of friends might be, but most people, particularly men, you have three sets of friends, distinct sets. You have your cronies. You go bowling, you play golf with your cronies. You have your couple friends. You and your wife see another couple for dinner. And then you have your business friends. Those are people you see at the office. You don't necessarily see them socially. Very well said, Joan. And yes. that was the, Phil Harris and Rochester and Dennis Day and Don Wilson. Right. They were business friends. So we saw them every Sunday. Well, Saturday was rehearsal and then the show on Sunday. And I knew them as my father's cast. They were always darling to me, but quite people have asked me, oh my God, over the years, what was Dennis Day really like? What was, I have no idea. I didn't know them mm -hmm. as people or as personal friends. But as far as you knew, they got along with your father in a business setting very well. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, they all adored him. And, okay, and but you know that is there was unique. That. Very often, again, the star can portray himself any way he wants. But in reality, when the camera turns off, 
he is not a lovely person, and the people around him are just as happy to stay as far away from him as possible. So I've heard. This is not who your father was. <laughs> no. Okay. I now come to his wife. First of all, what was Mary Livingston's real name? Sadie Marks. Sadie Marks. Yes. My understanding is she was a distant cousin of the Marx Brothers. That's an interesting story. I doubt it, okay? Okay, okay good. I doubt it. We'll clear up that Boba Misa. How did they meet? Do you know? I've heard a few stories, but I think the, the real meeting, my mother's sister, Babe, did a vaudeville act with her then husband. She was married very young to, I don't even remember what his name was, but they had some kind of, kind of mediocre vaudeville act. And they were playing in Los Angeles the same time my father was on the bill. And my father got to know Mary's sister, Babe, and Babe said, why don't you join us after dinner? My sister's coming along. And it was like a double date. And I think that's really where, how they met. Did they have a legitimate love relationship? Oh, I think so. Your mother ended up on both the radio show and the television show, Very correct? little on television. She only did a few shows, and then she didn't perform. She was always nervous. She was a very nervous performer, and by the time they got to television, it was almost like she couldn't take it anymore. Mm -hmm. She had done all she could do, and she would get so nervous, her hands would turn red. That was, you always knew. My father bit his nails, my mother's hands turned red. <laughs> would your father ever be nervous going on camera? Never showed it, but he bit his nails. <laughs> <laughs> do you remember, I meant to ask you this, do you remember the Jack Benny show where he and Giselle McKenzie play the violin? Oh, sure. Is that a classic, classic Isn't that, bit? Yeah, I love that. Um, but wait, I get chills just thinking about it. I hope many of our audience remember that moment. Getting to know you. Getting to play. know you. Yeah. And um, Giselle McKenzie was a great singer. Mm -hmm. The understanding I have is your father helped her with her career. Is that what you understand or not necessarily? He probably did. I'm not as aware of her, him helping her with her career as I am of him helping Jack Parr and he helped Johnny Carson. But I, I suspect he helped Giselle as well. As you're growing up, do uh, in, is there a succession of luminary stars coming through your home? Constantly. <laughs> <laughs> Was that fun for you? Was it intimidating for you? What? Well, it, it goes under the same category as looking back on it, did I dream it? Yes. My mother's two closest friends were Barbara Stanwyck and Claudette Colbert. Really? Now, I knew they were movie stars, but they were Aunt Barbara and Aunt Claudette. I mean, they were just my mother's friends. But I knew they were movie stars. There was always this dichotomy, this kind of paradox of they were on one side here and on over here something else. My parents used to have parties New Year's Eve. Every star in Hollywood came to those parties. They tented the backyard. And they would be, be an orchestra and dancing. And after the, all that festivities, <clears throat> they would wind up gathering in our living room. And then we would have what I guess you would call your ordinary home entertainment. <laughs> Judy Garland would sing. Um, George Burns would do it. Danny Kaye would do something. Tony Martin, Dinah Shore. They would all perform so for their this friends. Is, this is unbelievable. <laughs> well, doesn't everybody, Mark? <laughs> and you would be there? You were allowed to be there? No, I was no. not allowed to be there. I was on the upstairs landing, lying on my tummy, <laughs> looking over the banister mm -hmm. with my best friend, Sandra Burns, uh -huh. George Burns' daughter, uh -huh. the two of us. Incidentally, that is also supposed to be legendary, the relationship between your father <clears throat> and George Burns. To what extent is that true? It's beyond... Description. It's one of those things that I would kill to be able to convey the humor, to convey the hilariousness, if there's such a word. They were so funny together that you were just doubled over. <laughs> because, And the closer you were to them, the funnier it was because you were waiting for the... You knew that something was going to happen, so it was even funnier when it did. They were joined at the hip. They adored each other. My father could never make George laugh. 
Natty had my father, his name was Nathan Birnbaum. So we called him Natty, and his wife Gracie was Googie. They were Natty and Googie. And Natty could make my father laugh by just snapping his fingers. My father would be on the floor, and my father could never make him laugh. And he was always doing dirty tricks. I've been asked over and over things. He would, they lived fairly close to each other in Beverly Hills, and my father loved to walk. He would walk all around the town, and he'd be walking down Sunset Boulevard, and Natty would be driving there, and he would spot him and say, hey, Jack. And my father would cross the street, and just as he got to the car, Natty would drive away. That was just, but my father never caught on. I mean, he always crossed the street, and Natty always drove away. They'd talk on the phone, and Natty always hung up in the middle of the conversation. That started out way back when, when they met in vaudeville. And there was a time when Benny Rubin, who was a, a, an actor, on, was on the shows a lot as a character actor, bet my father that if he called Natty, he wouldn't hang up on him. And I think they bet $50. So Dad calls, <laughs> Dad calls Natty, and they talk, and they talk, and they talk, and George doesn't hang up. And finally, my father, in frustration, says, aren't you going to hang up on me? And Natty says, no, I have half of Benny's bed. <laughs> Very cute. These things, I mean, on and on and on. I can't tell you how funny they were. You had to be there. You had to be Did a part of it. Did you enjoy it? Did you enjoy your father and George Burns together? Oh, my God. I, was, I couldn't contain everybody. I mean, you couldn't not enjoy it. They were hysterical. Was George Burns a nice person? Yes. Uh, I've heard otherwise, but n never to me. And how about Gracie Allen? I knew Gracie. Actually, I did an interview about Gracie on PBS. They did a, a bio of her. And uh, the, the producer asked me if I would do an interview about her. I said, I'll do it, but you won't be able to use any of it. Because I only knew her, and I knew her well, but I knew her as Sandra's mom, Sandra's mother. And Sandra knew my mother, you know, what do you think of Mary Livingston? I just knew her as Joan's mother, you know. <laughs> no, get out of the pool, you know. <laughs> Dinner's ready, come on. Wash your hands. <laughs> That's what mothers did. And you were a little too young to really understand whatever the dynamic was between the two of them. Or did you say to yourself, yeah, yeah, I, uh, Sandra's, mother really, Sandra's, Sandra's mother and father really like each other? I think they did. I it was all about, with, with Natty, it was all about show business. Uh -huh. um, I think with my father, a little bit less so. Okay. To what extent of it all did Jack Benny, whose father and mother were both Jewish, Meyer Kabelski and Emma Sachs, and he was named Benjamin Kabelski, born in 1894. To what extent did Jewishness mean anything to your father? Oh, Mark, that's a good question. We were not religious, not at all. My, now, I didn't know his parents. His mother died before I was born. His father, I knew, I think he died when I was seven or eight years old. He lived in Florida. And I met him, but I have no memory of him. Okay. My mother's parents lived close to us, and, and I was very close to them. They were wonderful. And her parents were, um, their name was Marks. And... Oh, she was Jewish also. Jewish also. Yes. My mother, yes, on both yes. sides. Because there were many people who thought Jack Benny married Mary Livingston, who was not Jewish, but yeah, Mary no. was Jewish. Yeah, Sadie yes. Marks. Okay, Sadie Marks was her given name. Yes. Okay, and you were close to her parents. Yes. Okay, and they were wonderful to you. They lived near us, and I just remember, because we were not religious, but I do remember my grandfather, Papa, as I called him, Papa, read the Daily Forward, the, the Yiddish Forbids. paper, yes. yes. I don't know whether he read it in Yiddish or not. Yes. And he played Pinochle, which I think was a very Jewish <laughs> yes. thing with his friends at the beach. Yes. And my grandmother, Mama, she, um, I don't remember anything particularly Jewish about her except we had Friday night dinner at, at their house frequently. And she was a marvelous cook. I used to love those Friday night dinners. I do not remember whether there were candles uh -huh. or that there was any religious service of uh -huh. any kind. But I remember that she made something called 
Grivenous. Uh -huh. Is that right? Grivenous. Yes. About as unhealthy as you could get, but boy, were they good. Yes. I love that. And that's about as religious as our family was. Okay. There are many, many Jews, Joan, who are not observant Jews in any way. But they still have a Jewish identity. They oh, care about the so. Jewish people. Very much so. And you know that they're Jewish in their heart, and they just don't express it, quote, religiously. Was that your father and mother in any way? Well, you know there's a difference between, I've heard people say, your father was a, a Jewish comic. He wasn't. Jackie Mason is a Jewish comic. My father was a comedian who happened to be Jewish. Yes. But he wasn't a Jewish comic. Right. And his show, whether it was on radio or on television, was not a Jewish show. Not at all. Okay, so Molly Goldberg did a Jewish yes, show. Yes, okay? exactly. But your father was doing American comedy. Exactly. And the fact that he was Jewish was known by people who knew, but it had nothing to do, it right. was not intrinsic to the humor, although you have to understand that well, <laughs> the Jewish people always find, especially when somebody is, a, is wonderful in their craft, they find a way that in somehow the individual, the artist, was influenced by a Jewish background or something in their Jewish nature. Right. And there was, it was impossible for me to watch your father without thinking that although explicitly there was nothing Jewish about his humor, there was his soul and there was a gentleness to him. Yes. And he... The, again, the conceit of the show was he was often the butt oh, of yes. the joke, right? But there was something about Jack Benny where you felt that you were watching someone who was influenced by a Jewish past in some way. Do you know what I'm talking about? I do, but I would not have been aware of that. But I have, I have a question for you. How would, what would you say about George Burns? To me, George Burns is very much the same way. Now, George Burns had a more typically Eastern European Jewish style to him. Your father did not. I always saw my grandfather in George Burns. Really? Yes. I did not see my grandfather in Jack Benny. But when George had a way of talking and a way of with its, he would do a monologue at the beginning of his TV show with a cigar <clears throat> and he would set up the show and there was something again George Burns had his television persona and it's true that I identified that in my own mind more with the grandfather generation of Jews than I did with Jack Benny but to me, both of them were Jewish. Mm -hmm. Yes. Even though they're humor. I think you, you make a very important point. The Jack Benny show was not Jewish comedy. And neither was George Burns. Exactly. Jewish comedy. Exactly. Um, but what I am asking you is, leave the observance out. Did your father ever hide the fact that he was Jewish? Never. Did your mother? No. When you were growing up, did you know you had Jewish parents? <laughs> you know what I, mean by I could that? be facetious and say the only reason I knew I was Jewish is we belonged to Hillcrest. <laughs> Which was? <laughs> the Jewish Country Club. Exactly. Uh, okay. Your life itself was American. Yes, absolutely. Okay. You know, we came across, Joan, a piece that was written about your father in 1962. And we spoke off camera that very often a celebrity of the stature of your father there are things that are known about him that even his daughter might not know, okay? In 1962, a piece was written in your fa about your father who said how I, meaning Jack Benny, how I became interested in Israel. Are you familiar with that piece at all? No. Can I tell you about it? Please. Okay, it's interesting. There's a piece that's written. It was written in Canada. And it describes how your father recounts that another one of his good friends was Eddie Cantor. Yes. True? Yes. Do you remember Eddie Cantor? Very well. He lived up the street from us. Really? But well, this is a kick, isn't it, Joan? <laughs> <laughs> Especially in retrospect. Eddie Cantor evidently was a good friend of your father, as you say. And Eddie Cantor was supposed to host an Israel Bonds dinner. And he asked your father to fill in when he became sick. 
And your father ultimately raised an enormous amount of money for Israel bonds. He gave Eddie Cantor, according to the story, a blank check and said to Eddie Cantor, you fill in the amount you want me to give to Israel bonds. And ultimately, Eddie Cantor wrote a check for $25,000 in there. When $25,000 $25, is still a lot of money, but it was an awful lot of money then. Yes. And what really is extraordinary is your father did benefits for Israel bonds in Toronto and Atlantic City and raised, and again, you and I understand this, relative scale. Yes. He raised for Israel bonds $1.2 million. That's enormous. Extraordinary That's amount enormous. of money. That's enormous. Extraordinary amount. And he also talked about how, especially as the state of Israel was in its infancy, the earliest, I mean, Israel is founded in 1948. Mm -hmm. This is before the Six Day War of <clears throat> 1967. And your father was talking about how, out of your own father's sense of humanity, a general sense of who he was as a person, he felt compelled to aid the infant state of Israel, which was his Jewish state. Yes. And I found that interesting because, in some way, for, for, for your father, I understand, was very philanthropic. Yes. Despite the TV joke, he was a very giving person. Very. True? Very. Okay. Absolutely. And one of the things that he did give to was the state of Israel. <clears throat> and I have no idea what other Jewish causes he gave to. But it's clear to me that your father was very aware of his Jewish identity. Yes. And, That's true. And, um, again, there were some people of his stature who played it, who didn't ever want people to know he was Jewish. That was not who your father and mother were. No, not at all. And here he is, both giving and raising an incredible amount of money for the state of Israel when it was very, very important in their history. And it's something which you have a right to be proud of. I'm, thank you for telling me, because I am very proud of that, and I didn't know that until you just told me. Yes, well, it's one of the things that I really wanted our audience to know. Many people loved your father purely as a wonderful entertainer. And there's a famous picture of him playing the violin, and President Harry Truman is playing the piano. Oh, I have that picture. Okay. Neither one of them were great in their craft, no. but they both loved it, didn't it? Yes. Didn't they? Oh, yes. And that's a, also a sense of who your father was. And we, the audience, I mean, you know, I never knew your father. I'm really, I really wish that in some way life had been <coughs> such that I was doing this kind of work and your father was still there. I would have loved to have met him, yes. talked to him. And, you would have. <laughs> and, got to know him. and I believe I would have really had enormous personal affection as I had affection for this character on the screen. I also did have affection for George Burns. Um, but I feel your father was an unusual entertainer of his era. And the other thing I wanted you to talk about for one moment, you know, we touched on it already, that you had this, this opportunity as a young child, and I don't know how long it lasted. I don't know whether you were still in high school or whatever, but that these extraordinary luminaries came through his life. The ones that I, the names that I understand were part of his world were the George Burns. Also was Bob Hope. Is that true? Bob Hope was not as close a personal friend as far as people who came to our house for dinner. Um, he and Dolores, I don't remember them coming to our house for dinner, but my father and Bob were good friends, and I know they liked each other a lot, okay. but they were not as close friends. The close friends were uh, Gary and Rocky Cooper, Jimmy and Gloria Stewart. They, were over, they came to our house a lot, and I mentioned Claudette Colbert, Barbara Stanwyck. Um, well, oh, my favorite, Van Johnson. I loved Van Johnson. Who couldn't love Van Johnson? Well, he was so he was so nice to me when I was ten years old. He wanted to know what I was doing and who I was. See I mean, he was interested. How many grown-ups are interested in a ten-year-old? Very few. Been? Yeah. Very few. So I loved him because okay. he he cared. <laughs> How did Jack Benny feel about Johnny Carson? Oh, he adored Johnny. He just adored Johnny Carson. And in some way, he helped Johnny Carson become who he was. Yeah, he did. Yes, he did. And. Johnny Carson did a wonderful <clears throat> imitation of your father and incorporated yes. the, you know, the look. And in some way, 
it extended your father's presence because we knew every time Johnny Carson did it, it was Jack Benny. Yeah, it's, that's true. I hadn't thought of that. You said, excuse me, may I inject a moment of humor because you said something that Please. reminded me of a story. Please. You mentioned my father playing the violin with Harry Truman playing yes. the piano. Uh, have you heard the story? And you know my father, they used to tease him, of course. See, there were jokes about him. I digress. Isaac Stern said about my father, when your father walks out on the stage in his tuxedo or his white tie and tails, he is so elegant. It's a shame he has to play. <laughs> but the, and the other story about that was what my father was going to, to the White House to visit Harry Truman. And as he was going in, he had his violin case, and the security guard said, Mr. Benny, um, I have to ask you what's in the violin case. And my father, to be stupidly funny, said, oh, it's a machine gun. And the guard said, oh, thank God, I thought it was your violin. <laughs> <laughs> your father did play with Isaac Stern once, didn't he? Oh, a few times, yeah, sure. Isn't that lovely? So here you are. You're Joan Benny. Does it make it hard for you, Joan, when you're in high school? In other words, you aren't just another 14, 15, 16, 17-year-old. You are the daughter of, you know, a, a, an enormous celebrity. Yes, you live in uh, Beverly Hills. You're not the only child exactly. of a celebrity. Exactly, exactly. Okay. But at some point, you're with non-celebrity kids. The first time I was really different was when I went to college because up until then there had been so many in, in both in my grade school and in high school there were so many other celebrity kids that I was just one of many I mean I wasn't different from, from the rest of them when I went to college then there were only a couple of others Gary Crosby was uh, in the same class and there was which uh, school Stanford and Dick Zanuck who died recently, he was in my class at Stanford. And Warner Leroy's son, Mer uh, Mervyn Leroy's son, Warner. Um, but that was the first time where I kind of felt different. Mm -hmm. And it was funny, it was strange. I got over it very quickly because I loved college and I made a lot of friends and I had a great time. But at first, um, it felt strange. For the very first time of, that I was a little different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, it's hard sometimes to be the child of a rabbi because the <clears> rabbi's <throat> daughter, the rabbi's son, especially in a typical congregation, there are expectations that are placed upon the child. Absolutely. Sometimes very unfair. Of course. Is there anything equivalent to a celebrity's child? And the reason I also ask you is we have heard so many times stories of the children of celebrities <clears throat> who have a hard time because they're the children of celebrities. So I'm asking you two questions. How did it affect you? And what did you see happen to the celebrity friends you were growing up with? Oh, it's an interesting question and a fairly easy one. For starters, I think it's harder for boys because certainly back in those days, boys were expected to have careers. Girls were just expected to get married. Nobody really cared a lot. Um, and it was hard for a boy like George Burns' son, for example, because he wasn't an academic. Uh, he wasn't going to be a doctor or a lawyer. He didn't have the talent to be the comedian that George was. What's he supposed to do? How can he live up to? Uh, Frank Sinatra's son, Frank Jr., don't be a singer, you know, you can't compete. So for God's sake, go into another profession. But he chose to be a singer. He had a very, he's had a sad life. You can't be Frank Sinatra Jr. Um, different for a girl and a lot easier. But it was drummed into me by my mother at a very early age that anything you do reflects on your father. If your name is in the paper for having done something illegal or whatever, it's not going to be Joni. It's going to be Jack Benny's daughter. And I know how much you love your father, and you don't ever want to see anything like that in the paper. So you be good. <laughs> <laughs> Was it a burden at times? Or were you just good all the time, Joan? 
I was never good. No, but that's I didn't not get possible. Caught. I didn't get caught. <laughs> um, so you go to Stanford, and you have a life of your own. Yes. You get married. Yes. Children. Yes. How many? Four. Four children. Mm. Congratulations. Where Thank are they you. in life now? My older son is a doctor. He went to Stanford, Columbia Medical School, and he's an ER doctor. He's in California. Nice. I have a daughter at, in um, Colorado who is a computer programmer for Quest. My kids are all math science. None of them have any, uh, any uh, talent artistic? for uh, nothing. There isn't an artistic bone among them. <laughs> and then my younger two. I had two children, and then I was divorced. I remarried. And I had, 10 years later, had two more children. And the two younger ones, I'm, I'm proud of all of them, but the two, my son, my younger son, uh, and I, I think of my dad with this because I told you my father never got through high school. And he always felt badly about that. He always felt that he wasn't educated enough. He, he read a lot. He tried to educate himself, and he did. He was a very bright man. He did a lot of reading. But he felt the, the lack of that, that formal education. And I always thought when my son got his PhD from MIT, I wanted so much for my dad to have seen my grandson getting a PhD from MIT. Oh my God, that's the top of the world. Yes. You can't get better than that. That is lovely. And so he's, um, he is with a company, he's an executive vice president of a tech company based in Cambridge. And my youngest, Joanna, lives in Wellesley, and she's married to a techie, and, and she's a businesswoman, very successful. All, all four of my children, it, I'm lucky, oh my God, lucky, all four of my children are very successful, not having anything to do with family money. They've done it all on their own. That must make you very, very proud. And now I have two grandsons, one who is graduating Mazel from... Tov. No, I have five grand... I have, wait a minute, three, four, five, six grandsons. Really? One granddaughter. Yes. My two older grandsons, one is graduating from Duke, which is where my daughter went. My younger daughter met her husband at Duke, got married, had children, and now she has a son who's graduating from Duke. Isn't that thrilling? Isn't that marvelous? Isn't and he already has a job. <laughs> When a grandchild has a job there, it's nothing better, right? <laughs> that is, that's really, really lovely. Your father, ultimately, I believe, in 1974, was diagnosed with cancer. Is that correct? Yes. And he had pancreatic cancer. He did. And he passed away shortly after he was diagnosed. Yes. Um, how old was he? Do you remember? He was just short of his 81st birthday. Okay. When you talk about him, you talk about him in a very, very loving way. And I'm just wondering, as you now sort of, again, you also have, have lived a wonderful life. You have children and grandchildren. You've done many things with your life. As you look back at your, your life with him, what's the tone? What do you keep with you all the time of your father? Um. A few things, but one, I think, first of all, as I guess you know, I was adopted, and I think, how lucky can you get? Boy, talk about being in the right place at the right time. <laughs> um, I can't believe that I, you know, I wake up in the morning and how did I get that lucky how, to have a father like that? He was, he was amazing. And by the way, speaking of when he died, Bob Hope, he was not quite 81. And by the way, he didn't really suffer very much at all, which was a blessing. Absolutely. Um, the few months before he was diagnosed, he complained about having stomach pains. He'd play golf and he'd say, oh, my stomach hurts. And fortunately, he was a known hypochondriac. So <laughs> when he'd come home with, you know, you know, Joni, I had these terrible pains today. Oh, Daddy, you're such a hypochondriac. Take a couple of pills and, you know, go read a book. Um, and, and he believed it because he knew he was a hypochondriac, so it, he didn't know that there was anything seriously wrong. And then when it finally was diagnosed, he died less than a month later, so it was quick, and, I, you know, he, they kept him pretty much out of it. So he really didn't suffer at the end. I'm glad. But the last year of his life, he was really starting to slow down. 
he was having a little more trouble memorizing lines. So, with that in mind, at his funeral, Bob Hope, in his eulogy, said, for, for once, Jack Benny lost his famous timing. He left us too soon. So after the funeral, we're all back at the house. And I said, Bob, I said, forgive me, but you're absolutely wrong. I said, my father's timing was perfect right to the end. I can't think of any th more horrible fate than a performer not being able to perform. That would have been worse than death. And I think he died at the right time. He was still on top. He had a movie coming up. He had a television special coming up. What better way to go? That's a very wise and beautiful thing for you to have said. It's been lovely meeting you. You have Jack Benny's soul, and it's really lovely to meet you. That's very sweet of you. No, it's, <laughs> you are very special, and you went out of your way to talk to me, and I'm very, very grateful. A, a lot of people who were watching this, they felt they knew your father, and that's really why I wanted to talk to you. It's just a way for us to be a little closer to somebody who meant a lot to us. And although we talked about it, this was not an observant Jew. He was Jewish. Oh, and, yes. And he knew he was Jewish. He was proud of being Jewish. He cared about the state of Israel. And he brought into the world you. He certainly passed that on down to me, too, about being Jewish. Did he? Oh, yes. There's no question in your mind you're Jewish. Oh, my God, no. Very proud to be Jewish. And I care a lot. Well, it's been lovely meeting you. And I hope in some way our paths continue to cross. And the, in Hebrew it said, we wish you kol tu v'hatzlacha, only goodness and success. And thank, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Your, you're wonderful. Thank you, Joan. My meeting with Joan Benny, Jack Benny's daughter. I hope you enjoyed meeting her as much as I did. But as always, I invite you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments you may have to anything we discussed here. Did you know Jack Benny? What I mean, no. Did you watch him? Did you... When you hear me talk about what he meant to me and how much I enjoyed just having him in my home, whether it was on the radio, and again, I would listen to him at night. I would be in bed and I'd have the radio next to me. And, and he would just make me laugh. And then, obviously, I would watch him on television. Did any of you have the same experience? Was Jack Benny a part of your life? And as you hear Joan discuss the life she had with her father and who her father was does it in any way bring back lovely memories for you i would love to hear from you so please email me write me post on our facebook wall tweet me i look forward to hearing from you until the next time i'm mark Gollum lechayim my friends goodbye We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support Shalom TV with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the Shalom TV website homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive on DVD with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support. L'chaim is a presentation of Jewish Education in Media.